discuss over the course of the next 20, 25 minutes is really about how AI is going to make a difference to our work. But at the same time, how we need to particularly, by you know, of course, there's going to be a lot of governance and government putting in a lot of policies in place for AI. Uh, but at an individual level, we also need to see in our businesses or our organizations how we're going to deploy AI, which would be worthy and not put our organizations at risk, our people at risk, and our work at risk. Because, uh, you know, it's not just about, uh, you know, automation, but it is also about automation with care. So I think given that uh, agenda, we are going to sort of have this discussion in the next 20 minutes, starting with you, Sadesh. Um, you know, we are already seeing generative AI capturing pretty much everybody's interest. And, you know, um, um, Ankush is there. And I think his first question was that, you know, how many of you are actually replacing your people with AI? Now, that is a reality of our times to come. Uh, but having said that, you know, if we want to replace, even if we want to replace people with AI doing our jobs, how can we make sure the quality is just the same? You know, how can, um, you know, your, your work, I mean, I'm an editor, so I can tell you my content, I can only replace a human with an AI if my content is no different from what my editorial people were writing to what AI is writing. So how, how do we ensure that, and I particularly, you know, I have a very responsible job. I have to give the right information to people. So to all my readers, to all my audience, how, how can I be sure that if I'm getting it read, written through an AI bot, it's, it's right and it's absolutely accurate. Thank you, Riku. Let me start with wishing all the lovely ladies in the audience and the panel a very Thank happy very Women's yes, Day. Thank you for recognizing our day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so uh, Ritu, when we, we talk about uh, the first piece is, is uh, what Genia is bringing in. Uh, it's not about replacing humans, but it is about augmenting human humans. Uh, yes, there is a good amount of reskilling that will come in as we, as we go through this journey. Uh, but it is about how do I augment uh, the, the human intelligence to take it to the next level uh, in terms of uh, improving productivity, improving your customer experience and the various aspects to it. Um, now when you talk about Gen AI, the piece that Gen AI brings in is your ability to do a, a lot of things that you could do earlier, some, some aspects of it, but the ability to do it with a minimal amount of data in, in a very, very short time. Of course, it brings in its, its amount of risk as well. A foundation model is trained on data, which is uh, data available in the open domain. It is it is billions of parameters. So typically, large language model is about 700 billion parameters. Now, when it comes into my organization, my enterprise, uh, I don't really know what element of that training is coming in and what is it what is it responding to and how do I ensure that what it responds to is in line what with with my my business frameworks. And which is where the whole governance piece comes in, Ritu, and becomes extremely important on how do I put the guardrails on on uh, ensuring that this is one is it is it is trained on data which is relevant to my enterprise. Uh, I do not want things which are uh, the intent as a when I talk about AI for business, I am not about write, talking about writing beautiful poems. I am talking about how can I really apply this to my business and and, and get results out of it. So how do I uh, adapt it to my enterprise? How do I uh, train it to uh, reflect the, the reality of, of the industry I, I belong to and, and the, the enterprise I belong to? And how do I get it? And put the guardrails in terms of explainability, in terms of bias, in terms of drift, all of those elements that go in. Uh, one of the biggest challenges Riku, that Jenny has seen, and, and we're going through the hype cycle, everybody, last few quarters, has been a massive hype and, and I think as we settle down we will go past the hype cycle into adoption from pilots to, 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 to the real production but as we as we go through that we are realizing that uh, the the explainability part or, or more than the explainability part the, the who's accountable part is a piece that people are struggling to answer so is is the business owner accountable or is the model uh, accountable who is accountable and which is where you've got to make it uh, in a way that the LOB now can take responsibility. This is the model I have deployed and I, I can be a company. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to come back to your question. Uh, 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 
there is a design cost approach to AI which we all understand. So now when you deploy this design first approach and you know it becomes AI becomes more mainstream as we go forward, how how are we going to sort of control things? You know, ultimately it's a human thing, right? What we teach our machines is also something that is going to be feeded by humans. So in that design first approach, as he was saying, and just to take that conversation forward, um, you know, I was telling him earlier that uh, if if somebody is uh, going first to AI and saying that, okay, look, use my model and create an AI fit for me. So now the next few companies that are going to come in that sector, let's say insurance or education or let's say any other, they are also going to sort of learn from their, their models are going to be also taken a prerogative from the first company that started. So now, now when you talk about a design first, how do we also keep security of our information? You know, all organizations are built on certain practices uh, that uh, make them great and make them uh, good at what they are. Now if those practices are sort of uh, on an auto level only going to be feeded into a machine, in every organization, what, how do we differentiate organizations? I think that's a good question. So, just to make it easy for everyone to understand that, I'll come to the first question which you asked, uh, sir, that uh, uh, is, it, is, it, is it the AI going to replace any human being who is writing a content for me or maybe how I'm going to stop that uh, for, for the AI? So, I, when I was in college, my teacher told a very, said a very beautiful thing. He said that, your success relies on what type of questions you ask. And I think today, I think that, that he was supposed to say that you should ask the right question to a teacher, but today when it comes to generative AI, it's all about the quality of the question which you ask. If there is a very depth in your question, the quality of the outcome of that question will be very, very useful. That's point number one. Second, um, when it's all about logic rather than the syntax, now, when we were in colleges and uh, now we have 200 people globally who are working in the company where a cyber risk quantification company in SaaS where we used to develop cyber risk uh, platform. So, I was having a person who is from Dhanbad. It's a very uh, I ISM Dhanbad. His father is an auto rickshaw driver. He's a, having a very good salary right now in my office. He was having 23 supplies in his, uh, uh, in his entire BTEC. But the guy was very good in C++. One language only. The goal of that individual was to be, be pr become very proficient in one language and understand the logic. So when you want to do two plus two, you know the logic, right? You need to just addition. Uh, you have to do addition of two numbers. But in future, you, now it's all about the logic. If you know the logic, syntax is not a problem anymore. So for a company like for a company which is in security like us for our, our challenge was first is the governance what government will bringing on the table and second i think as a company we we when we when we adopted LLM, llm model we call it safe gpt our, our platform name is safe so we have a, a product known as safe gpt where we have a very uh, airtight uh, uh, cloud account where customers entire uh, platforms of security, their cloud, all the cyber security ecosystem is adapt and our mobile application which is powered by LMN system is attached to it. We have 14 red, te red teamers, red teamers means the people who are expert in terms of breaking the cyber security of any product. So this is kind of in the security of an LLM system. They will keep on feeding the wrong information and try to break the logic of LLM. So when they will be able to reply something, whether they are replying in a mannerful manner or whether they are replying in a very, very, very easy manner or in a compliant manner. And second one is that we are also ensuring that the ecosystem we are developing in terms of the overall LLM model, which is, which is along, with, along, along with the traditional open AI and other company, we have started working on building our own LLM model also. So like you mentioned, there are so many players who are doing something with their own models. So I think at the end of the day, we in, 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 in some time you will see that every organization with respect to their industry, they will be having their own LLM model launching for the world. Like if you see, Ola has, uh, Ola has launched their own LLM model known as Kritrim. Yeah. So with respect to their ecosystem. So in the similar manner, for, for example, we in cybersecurity, cybersecurity industry will be having their own LLM model, which is 
specially designed with this to cater their information. Hospitality will be having different and so and so forth. And on top of that, every organization will be having certain compliances to follow. Right now, it's it's around the world for for everyone. But in future, you will see it will be very industry specific and uh, maybe geographical specific also as you move forward. Sure. Yeah, I, mean, th I think that should probably be a saving grace for a lot of companies who are looking at uh, deploying AI into their systems. But, uh, but you know, again, we'll come back, that's the second round of discussion that we'll get into. Uh, so, you know, now, given the fact that AI is something that is mainstream and everybody is going to deploy AI at one level or the other. Now, what do you think the role of a CTO or a CISO is going to evolve uh, to be? You know, how are they going to make sure that not just do they have to deploy AI, but they also have to make sure that they are, their organization and their data is safe enough, uh, you know, so that it doesn't sort of, as I was saying earlier also, that it doesn't sort of go to the market because that is sometimes what the organization's core is and you don't want to send that into the market. So therefore, what do CTOs, CIOs, CISOs need to work on? So there is a, uh, there will always be a push and pull in an organization. I was having a chat with a CTO today. They are in a business of providing communication technology for smart meters. And uh, his one worry was uh, security of data. Uh, but his contrary worry also was that majority of his talent is very young talent, very uh, keen to use open AI. And he's worried that his code base is being exposed there for both uh, testing as well as uh, optimization. And uh, my straight out of the box thought to him was that basically your code is now up in the open. The open AI has understood whatever that you're doing. It now becomes a baseline for everyone else to work on, right? So your own IP and whatever differentiation that you have is potentially gone. So the question for you is that as a CTO, uh, you have the benefit of a large language model or any technology that is coming along with it that can potentially reduce your time to market. But on the security side of the house, you tend to lose a lot. So that's one challenge that is coming in. And my own thesis with this is, uh, I've been now in this business for 10 years in my own company. And every three, four years, something comes up. It used to be cloud and then big data and then blockchain. and I mean, there will be a hype that comes, there is a set of uh, uh, the curve of despair as they call it will come in and the settlement that happens somewhere in terms of how a version of a technology becomes applicable to you. So let's say if you look at us, LLM doesn't make any sense, we are a very restricted data set that we work off. Uh, ML probably is a much better uh, way to look at it versus LLM, doesn't work for us. So every organization therefore has to look at it just because everyone is saying LLMs and ChatGPTs and Geminis and whatever else may be there. It, the applicability of that for you as an organization, as a CTO or a CEO is absolutely essential. And a version of that or a, or a subset of that may be relevant, but not everything will be relevant. So don't get pulled by the hype. And there are downside risks uh, from a leaking of information, leaking of uh, IP perspective, that one has to be watchful about. Absolutely. I was, ma'am, I was going to actually ask you about the downsides. He just touched upon it. But today, you know, for you and Fujitsu, when you think of AI, uh, what, what are the downsides you are considering? And I mean, for largely for organizations, what are the top downsides they have to sort of look at more closely before uh, they look to deploy AI and they should be ready for it? Yeah, I think the biggest downside is what you are uh, focusing on, right? To be responsible enough to deploy the AI applications, right? So, uh, just to give you a background, I'm leading uh, one of the largest project of Fujitsu, that is Monaka Supercomputing Project from India side. And uh, Monaka is a two nanometer chip which is going to be used to make next gen data center for Japan. So uh, now this is a project where everything comes in, right from HPC to responsible AI and things like that. I'll focus my discussions on the part that we are here for, that is responsible AI. So when we talk about you know, developing a technology uh, for 
something that's going to host a variety of AI applications, not just like uh, LLMs. It might be a computer vision, any kind of AI application that we know of. Uh, I think it's very important that organizations take uh, ethical AI very seriously. And uh, ethical AI is all about using the right regula regulations, the right set of people who can uh, look into the diversity aspect of the data set which you are using to train the model. Now today because it's a women's day and uh, you know uh, it is a matter of concern that even though uh, we are you know AI is pervasive with every walks of life but we still have just 22% women worldwide who are part of this ecosystem. Uh, it, and it's not just my opinion and it's not like I am vouching to get more women in AI but yes even if you see World Economic Forum reports it is said that women bring a different perspective to the table, right? Multifaceted perspective. And I really feel that we need to get people of diverse background, not just women, uh, in AI, right? And that's important uh, to have a data set which is more homogeneous. Because you see, if you study about the case studies of how AI has gone wrong, uh, like, uh, I won't name any company, but the solution where the credit rating of women is lesser as compared to that of men or of a particular uh, race of people, you know, they are uh, convicted more easily as compared to other sets of people. The recent example of Gemini of how uh, it went against our own Prime Minister, right? Everybody might be knowing that story of how it was projected. So uh, it is a big responsibility and I think uh, it is not difficult to manage this responsibility. It's, ju it's just that as an organization we should have an independent uh, AI governance uh, sector and uh, you know you should have right set of people who can also look into the homogeneity and the diversity that you bring in the data set which you are using to train the model. Most of the time what ha uh, I have seen like I have worked a lot with startup ecosystem even before I had joined Fujitsu for this project and I have seen many a times what happens is in the rush to deliver applications uh, we start off with a model which is already trained available online and then you try to tweak in to a smaller set of data set because fetching the real data set is not an easy job. Right? So in order to come out with a quick solution, we uh, tend to compromise on uh, this uh, diversity inclusion which should otherwise brought into the data set. And I uh, feel that you know, we'll be able to monitor this more closely if we have a independent AI governance uh, sector or department or units uh, in companies, whether it's small or big. Right? Because when you deliver the solution, you are always wanting to cater to a larger set of people, right? No company even starts off a startup and says we just want to be focused on two clients at a time. It's never like that, right? You always want to go and gather as much as possible. So why to compromise on the base which is the which is going to lead to the outcome of applications which are generating. Sure. Right? So that's the point. Yeah. Sure. No, I think that's a very good take on uh, how you look at AI yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we like to know a little more about what you are sort of the supposed of a computing that you are building over there and, you know, what exactly its function is going to be. But Sinesh, you know, uh, ma'am just touched upon um, the fact that, uh, you know, we've had some erratic information coming from generative AI uh, and some of it which was not publicly liked either. Now, given that situation, uh, and, you know, AI results will change. Um, and then we've also had a governance policy of the government recently where every uh, startup in AI, on, so not on a very basic or a foundational level, but one presumes that AI companies will grow very fast. So there is going to be governance in terms of what they're developing. Now, how, how, what kind of impact will that have um, in terms of building a AI model which is probably righteous? Um, and do you think... Uh, I mean, you know, whether it is to say with credit rating of women or a certain caste being put in a certain way or, you know, for that matter, even uh, putting our Prime Minister on the spotlight, uh, will the changed answers of uh, generative AI need to, uh, lead to some fundamentally different decisions being taken? So, so when, I, when I 
when you talk about before I answer this question, I want to step back uh, on your design first piece, and I'll come to this question uh, right. uh, subsequently so that we we, we can. Uh, now, when I when I talk about uh, a design first approach, right, and and uh, Ankit alluded to it, uh, uh, typically any model, uh, any organization, any enterprise, uh, it's not about. A, 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 a particular use case calls for a particular model and that may change depending on what, what the need of that R is and what that particular enterprise department needs. Uh, so it could be a simple Python based program or it could be a Jupyter notebook, it could be an ML program uh, Punkit alluded to or it could be an LLM as well uh, and it will be a combination of all of these as it goes. In. So that becomes your first truth which is it is multi-model, it is multi-modal. So that is a, a, a fact that we all need to establish for our enterprise. The next aspect is, is you typically put this where the data lies, where your workflow lies, where your application lies. So your models are going to be across on-premise, it's going to be on cloud, on multiple cloud. So it's, it is going to be a hybrid scenario. Now given that scenario, how do I put in this whole, whole governance, whole security piece across a, a hybrid? The third element, which uh, to your question on, on the governance piece, uh, Priyanka spoke about, right? Now, on the governance piece, uh, there are there are three, four fundamental elements, and this this cuts across the elements of various models. So, you will need a governance on your ML models. You will need a governance on your LLM models also. So, you need an ML ops. You need an LLM ops as well. That cuts across the whole thing. Now, as you put this, what you're trying to do is you're putting a framework. Uh, that is able to to monitor this, uh, not on a case to basis, case to case basis. Today, what what? So so if I go back, let's say, let's say about a year back, what were banks trying to do? Uh, RBI had mandated that there should be no gender bias, there should be no caste bias. What were banks trying to do? Banks were putting in a committee, so there were five GMs who signed, and and it's it's like since a committee is approved, they, they, it, it it is assumed that there is no no bias. Uh, but technology today gives us an ability to measure this bias. So how do I put a framework that measures caste bias, measures gender bias? The data set can be measured on the bias it brings in. How do I bring in technology elements, platforms that measure that? Uh, how do I bring in elements of explainability? Uh, if a loan has been rejected to a, a, a lady, uh, why has that loan been rejected? If, if I do a swap of her gender, will that loan be still be rejected? So how do I bring in explainability and these are coming in as statutory requirements. The regulator is making it mandatory for an explainability around any AI model that, that puts in around. So be it RBI, be it, be it SEBI, be it IDRB, uh, uh, IRDA, all of them have put in a statutory framework around how do I, what is the explainability of, of what's coming in. The third element which Priyanka again spoke of, right? You start with a data set with an intent of doing something. Uh, but your data set keeps evolving over time and, and, and what you would have started with was probably with a certain intent but it drifts over time. How do I prevent and measure that drift is also also very very important. Uh, the fourth truth and I am calling these truths because these are, these are core principles on which we need to go and approach any, any, any AI model. So when we talk about, so this is, this is I would say a once in a lifetime opportunity for all of us, for us as individuals, for our enterprises, all of us. Now, how do I scale this, how do I, how do I embrace this at scale response is the, is the piece that comes in. Now, there is one more element that comes in here. One is, one part of the governance is the AI governance. The second part of the uh, piece is, is, is the data matters. The data quality, uh, the data governance piece aspects of it. So, how do I have data that is so if i want to want to uh, scale uh, to a level where i want to lower the center of gravity of ai to the lowest possible employee in the organization how do i do it i can't do it with the it department deciding that i'll mask this and mask that and but i can do it at a policy level at a framework level on deciding what can be shared what needs to be marked what is the pi information that that cannot be shared all of those things can come in as a policy and when you when you implement that as a policy and in the context of the DPDP that has just got passed by the parliament, this is becoming extremely critical. 
how do i bring in consent management into the whole whole piece uh, you you have a consent management you have a withdrawal of consent management when somebody withdraws that consent how do you ensure that not just your core application but everything that you shared downstream is is getting withdrawn so putting an ai model who does, which does a hyper personalized marketing campaign tomorrow with dpdp coming in and somebody has withdrawn his consent your model needs to be capable of detecting that and and, and adhering to those statutory rules so that's a slightly longish answer to your question uh, but I <coughs> but again you know i'll go back to my original question that you know i mean for example in a textbook if you go and read a certain answer it's the same answer you get every time and therefore you know as humans we know that this is the answer to things now if ai is going to the, the generative ai is going to change its answer uh, so quickly you know depending upon new data information that it receives where is going to be uh, authenticity of the question finding the right answer so uh, when we talk of gen ai it tries to emulate a human brain uh, so it is about putting things into a context so the response to a particular question in this context is this in a certain different context the response is something else now which is what brings it to a problem so all of this while brings in a phenomenal technology on the table it also brings us with challenges and which is what you call as hallucination the model with a, a full conviction goes and responds to something that it thinks it is right but is no longer is nowhere close to the fact that exists right so how do i have a governance framework that prevents as hallucination and and which is where the llm governance comes in uh, and one of the elements so uh, let me let me go back to a question how has governance changed between the old ml times and the llm times right uh ml times it was it was only about explainability bias and now the the llm world the the whole piece is getting back to provenance uh what has gone in to train this model is becoming a critical so the whole in the ml world a lineage was enough because i start with something i go back and trace to its origin and find out but in llm you are training it on billions and billions of records so what is coming in ritu is is I, I, which is where uh, uh, there are smaller models that are coming in uh, with a complete explainability sanity check uh, something that your finance has has uh, cleared your legal has cleared, cleared something that gives you an ip indemnity on what it what you deploy because you don't want to land, land up into a legal suit with someone because it was his copyright in terms of doing this you picked up a foundation model and done something and it it can trap you into a so how do i have that llm governance framework uh, it becomes very very critical uh, just one more aspect and it was it was what punkin spoke about a uh, uh, extremely important point which is about everybody is today concerned about the data privacy part of it is my llm what is my data secure and i have my card rails around the data i think practically every vendor out there confirms to that commits to that the more important aspect of it is is are the learnings of the data secure right so i have done this for a for a we, we just did this for a large insurance company we 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 put a llm model for their data capture and we did a quantum jump on the accuracy levels it could bring in now the typical approach that most vendors out there take is is a federated learning which means what the, what i i train here goes back to the foundation model now, now that is competitive advantage lost how do i protect the learnings of the data become an extremely important aspect and that to me my my understanding and you spoke about it uh, briefly in terms of competitive or sorry or can you also spoke about it uh, that is also critical aspect of your responsibility AI on how do i guard rail my learnings of data yeah you're right i think uh, that is going to be the biggest challenge and probably also the biggest opportunity that we'll uh, see in the times to come and might just lead to a whole new business set uh, to take frame from there. Uh, you know, and this is now to all three of you, do you at so what level of AI advisory would require human intervention? You know, so let's say AI has advised us to do a certain thing. I mean, I'm, I'm actually honestly thinking more from healthcare's perspective. Now, if a doctor puts it and says that, look, you know, this is what your course of treatment should be, then where does the doctor put his mind 
come and say, okay, now let me cut this out and use only this piece from that. And you know, now you look at this at multiple industry levels and multiple roles. Uh, so what what is the human intervention going to look like in the AI advice event? So I'll, I'll give you a small example by relating it with us, how we do that. As a company, to protect any company, you have your cloud, you have your cyber security tools, which now usually are 10 to 20 tools, along with you have your threat intels, which are coming from dark web, that virtual. So there's a multiple layers of information coming to you as a doctor to fix the health of a company, for example. Now the challenge for a doctor who is sitting that there is thousands of this data is coming to you and now you have to prioritize what to fix first which can really cause a heart attack or which can really cause something which can be damaging for that individual now that is where the agenity vi comes to picture where they will see based on the previous learning for example we have 40,000 insurance data claims like whenever a company got hacked they have to claim the insurance and they have to tell them that how we got hacked and how much we have spent to overcome that. Along with that, we have a database of almost last 10 years that how many companies got hacked. Not the game, but only got hacked and how they got hacked. Now, thanks to AI, being a doctor for me, whenever there is a loophole comes into my infrastructure from your ADR, from your cloud or anywhere, it immediately checks from that data lake that is this vulnerability or is this problem was there in those companies which got hacked? which previously it was very difficult for me to prioritize because criminals never change their path of hacking into something. And similar a disease, right? It comes on a similar way. So that will, for us, for a small chunk of data which we have, not the whole level. And we have to understand that this LLM and other thing based, it's a B2C and B2B different. It has to be, a different, we have to look this problem in a different manner. B2C will have problems you will never have people who like certified AI security practitioners will never have this certification soon because the way the things are changing in real time is very difficult. So for a doctor, based on the historical data of medical um, claims or something like that or based on the reports of the customer or of the patient, what is ha what has to be prioritized for, for the patient to be fixed first to ensure that we can decrease the probability of that health consequence that is where Janeti AI and other things will help. Uh, uh, Pankaj, you know, uh, what I would like to know is, where should humans not become lazy in in the in an AI world? Because you know that is not what we want. That we sort of increase our reliance so much on machines that we don't sort of put our own mind to things. And eventually, you know, how are we going to teach the machines uh, to sort of then be intelligent if? Stop working on things. So creativity and innovation, you can't have laziness in either of the two. Uh, for example, uh, I dread the day if the doctor would use a chat GPT to give you treatment, that's not the doctor I want to go to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, even already Dr. Google has made life difficult for everyone. This is the last place I want to be. But I would rather use oh, LLMs and the newer technologies for research, right? Because there is a I am hoping that larger organizations have the wherewithal to uh, verify, to go through humongous amount of data, there will be practical verifications, there will be uh, field trials, there are ways to verify a lot of information that individual doctors will never have, right? I mean, there is so much that happens with an individual when you walk into a, a doctor's office. And, and there used to be a time, it's no longer the case, but there used to be a time the doctor used to know you and your family personally. I mean, that's how the family doctors used to be. Um, they were in my mind their ML version of it because they would know, they would know what happens in your family and treat you accordingly. But uh, going to a doctor and having a laziness and I don't want to really go through and understand your history and based on some report, if I was just going to fit into a model and out comes a report and then I'll go and treat it, probably a very dangerous place to be. So laziness is okay in mundane tasks where even if you go wrong, nothing much significantly will change, right? Uh, but creativity, I mean, writing, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I was reading, I think there's a, in, in New York Museum, uh, MoMA, MoMA, there is this AI uh, wall that has taken hundreds of thousands of images and it constantly creates new AI images. 
uh, for you to see. All of them are brilliant, but there is no wow to it because there was no human involved in it. There is no amount of hours and creativity spent in creating that uh, piece of uh, art, or for that matter, a movie, or for that matter, an innovation. So there are places where it has a role. I still personally believe I'm not a big believer of using AI for something which is going to impact humanity big time uh, because if things go wrong. We're already seeing the, the impacts of wrong stuff that gets into the biases and very, very hard to correct, right? So however much you put guardrails, that ship has already sailed, right? It's very difficult to come back to it. What happened with social media and trying to put the genie back in the bottle, it's not going to happen. So there are things that we as organizations uh, need to be very careful about. And the only last thing I'll say is that unfortunately, like what happened with social media, very, very few companies are calling the shots in this space. It is not as federated as we would like to, to think. I mean, between five, ten companies, the world gets covered in 90% of what's happening from an innovation perspective. That's just too much power in the hands of too few. And their interests are not aligned to our interests. I mean, just being blunt out here, right? So, we need to be very watchful about what this means to nations and nation security. We have right now absolute geopolitical chaos and uh, this will get fed into a very different narrative that's very hard to come back from. Uh, so I've already been told on the time but very quickly Dr. Priyanka, you know, so what sectors are going to see the first impact of Gen AI uh, in India and you know, uh, probably we fundamentally see completely moving to AI in those sectors. I think uh, if you see from application perspective, AI has invaded all sectors, <laughs> right? And uh, the biggest uh, appreciation and acceptance of AI happened during COVID times because uh, 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 not just AI, I mean, the way technology kept us connected all across the world, of course, that's just one side of the coin. But the most important thing was the way AI was used to make uh, uh, drug molecules for uh, our vaccines, right, COVID vaccines. If you see how AstraZeneca worked or how majority of these companies worked to come up with a drug molecule within few months, uh, it was magical, right? Because if you see the total uh, pipeline of drug discovery, it typically takes eight to 10 years. And uh, of course, I mean, AI was previously also used for drug discovery, but as a, it got a public acceptance, right? And people saw the power and the way it can deliver. Of course, there are loopholes to it and every now and then we read about that as well. And that's what I call as the developing ecosystem of AI, right? This will go on. So, uh, so, so that's why I feel that, for example, I was involved as an AI advisor to some pharma companies and I helped them. Uh, develop their uh, AI pipeline for drug discovery as well. And I used to see, I mean, people are just intersecting the pipeline. Okay, we want a, a startup which is just working to identify one particular, which is just like 5% of the entire drug discovery industry, right? So what I mean to say is that whether you talk about how our AI has penetrated the uh, pharmacy industry or you just look at AI, how it has affected healthcare industry, how it is affecting the uh, everyday industry like retail, uh, you know, marketing sector, pre-sales sector, the way chat GPT is being used for pre-sales sector and whether we, like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so whether we like it or not, I mean, I think everybody is using chat GPT in one or the other way. Right, whether it's through Bing or the other Microsoft application that we are using. So what I mean to say is that uh, just like when I was graduating, I did my bachelor's in 1999, right, before 2000. And at that time, people were saying, oh, there is a dot-com revolution and it will go, it's going to change the job market. Then there was some other revolution in next 10, 10 years and people said, uh, this is going to take our jobs. I saw that nobody ever took jobs, it's just that new jobs kept getting created, right? The kind of work we are doing that, we never imagined 20 years from now that I would be leading a project and working on a 2 nanometer chip which is going to house so many cores. So what I mean to say is that humans have a humongous amount of creativity in them. And I think it's just not possible for any uh, AI system to completely match humans. Right? 
that that the the smarter they become the smarter we become so it's like a ecosystem and i think just like we say generative adversarial network this is a adversarial network of humans and ai system where we are competing against each other and ai will become start uh, smarter of course but like we are seeing the perils of ai and these perils are because it needs human intervention if you see the way chat gpt was trained it was a human uh, uh, you know inspired learning mechanism which was used even for making chat gpt so they actually used humans for validating the way the prompt used to generate the responses and that was used as a part of the training mechanism which was not very prevalent before gpt 3.5 came into existence right so what means uh, what this means is that even humans are now uh, being used very closely as a part of the ai training ecosystem which was not very prevalent few years from now right before uh, the the present gen llms came into picture so humans are very much part and parcel of even the way these ai systems are being developed and uh, we just cannot do anything about industrial revolution because this is how we have evolved over so many years right uh, and i think so our kids will evolve even faster the way they are so on a lighter note you know i was telling my daughter to uh, not look at alexa for your homework and now she's looking she's, she stopped that and now she moved to chat gpt instead <laughs> so thank you very much uh, to the